Okay, welcome back, everybody. This is our 10 a.m. event. And this one we're billing as a workshop. And our workshop is about getting ready for Solar Max, separating space weather fact from fiction. We have five speakers, and they will speak in this order. First will be Daniel Baker. He's the director of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Second will be Louis Lanzarotti. He's distinguished research professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark, New Jersey. Our third speaker is Michael Hess. He's the chief of the Space Weather Laboratory at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. That's NASA Goddard. Um, fourth speaker is Antti Pulkinen. Sorry about that. Um, associate professor at Catholic University in Washington, D.C and research associate with the Community um, coordinated. coordinated Modeling Center at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt. And our fifth speaker is Rodney Burek. He's the director of the Space Weather Prediction Test Bed at NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, before they get started, I just want to mention um, there are materials on the back table um, and they're also available online at www.nasa.gov forward slash sun earth. That's one word. And uh, there you'll find all briefing notes, bios of the panelists, and su a supporting feature story. Okay, good morning. Uh, Peter said, my name is Dan Baker. I'm from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, I'm also a lead investigator on several uh, NASA missions, and I'm presently chairing the decadal survey for solar and space physics that's ongoing with the National Academies. Uh, from this vantage point, um, I wanted to speak this morning about uh, the state of our understanding of the Sun-Earth system and uh, as a backdrop to understanding of space weather. The slide that you see uh, up here portrays uh, the um, missions that are presently operating for NASA relevant to solar and space physics. Uh, the ones in white are uh, in orbit and uh, operating. The ones in yellow are those that are anticipated to be available relatively shortly in development. We're at a unique place in solar and space physics having such a remarkable constellation of spacecraft. And these uh, spacecraft are uh, returning a, a spectacular view of the Sun-Earth uh, system. Each mission that gets added adds new capability to this, what we call the heliophysics uh, system observatory. I want now to show you an animation from one particular spacecraft. Uh, the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory was launched in uh, 2000. Uh, 10. It is uh, part of the Living with the Star program of NASA. This is from the first year of the spacecraft's operation. When you look at the sun, if you, I hope you don't look too long, but if you look at the sun, you see uh, a pale yellow object uh, in the sky. Um, you're probably pretty featureless to you, uh, but looking at the sun from space, we see uh, that it is uh, spectacular in its detail. The sun is a rather average um, main sequence star, uh, but it is the most important star in the universe as far as we humans are concerned. It's our nearest star, it's our sun. Um, the activity that uh, one sees uh, on the surface of the sun, these magnetic uh, active regions, coronal holes, uh, and uh, other features are uh, really uh, remarkable in the effects that they have on the Earth system. We see variations on every time scale, on every spatial scale. And uh, to me, these are breathtaking in, the, in their sweep. You see all the active regions here, the magnetic field lines are readily portrayed. And uh, this system is the driver of the space weather. We see uh, huge expulsions of plasma material in the outer part of the sun called the solar corona, the outer atmosphere. Um, these, uh, if uh, under the right circumstances, can uh, propagate toward Earth at millions of miles an hour, can cause significant effects 
and uh, Dr. Lanzarotti will talk about some of those. But I just uh, want to convey to you that all the things that you're seeing here from the first year of uh, the SDO operations are during a remarkably quiet period for the sun. And uh, in my next slide, I will talk about that. Uh, this is a, an image from a, a relatively recently published paper by Ronald Turner from Answer Corporation. It's published in the uh, very important AGU journal, Space Weather. Um, at the bottom part of this shows the record of sunspots. Sunspots are one relatively simple index, one way of looking at the solar activity, characterizing it. This uh, commences in about 1600, about the time that uh, Galileo first uh, trained a telescope on the sun. And uh, beginning in about 1750, there was a, a very systematic observation of uh, sunspots and uh, numbering from 1 to uh, present 24. And the uh, blue uh, curves there show that the sun undergoes an approximately 11-year uh, period of uh, activity. And uh, the, uh, it goes from uh, very uh, uh, weak conditions, solar minimum, to uh, some very uh, large maximum numbers. What's been quite important in the last year is that the sun has gone through the quietest period that it's uh, experienced in probably two centuries. The, um, what uh, Turner did was to examine from two years before minimum to two years after minimum for all of the numbered sunspot uh, sequences, cycles. And uh, what you see is that the most recent minimum was broader, deeper, and was very much comparable to a very low activity period called the Dalton Minimum back in the early 1800s. So this has been indeed a remarkable minimum time. And, and the animation that you saw before was all the stuff that was going on during very quiet conditions. Just about five years earlier than this minimum time, another NASA satellite called, and uh, ESA satellite jointly called SOHO was uh, imaging uh, the sun. And uh, what you see portrayed here, this will play through a couple of times, but this is an active region on the sun, a large flare. Uh, this gave rise to powerful solar energetic particles, which are the snow that you see in the picture here. This blasted out a large coronal mass ejection. There were, in fact, multiple of those. These propagated toward the Earth upward of several million miles an hour, some 10 billion tons of material expelled. And so the sun, in just a period of five years, went from uh, extreme activity, remarkably powerful activity, to very quiet conditions. The range of activity is extraordinary. So what are the effects of uh, this kind of solar activity on the uh, Earth system? What you see portrayed here is uh, the Earth's magnetic envelope called the magnetosphere. Uh, this is the sunward side. This is extended into a long comet-like tail on the night side. Uh, but the first thing that happens as a coronal mass ejection and the associated shock wave with it reaches the uh, Earth's vicinity is to compress and interact with the Earth's magnetic envelope. If the magnetic field conditions are correct, this can uh, interlink with the Earth's magnetic field. And this can lead to uh, very powerful storms within the system. And those powerful storms can give rise, in turn, to very energetic particles that affect spacecraft operation that uh, also lead to powerful enhancement of aurora and currents in the uh, upper regions of the Earth's uh, uh, polar and mid-latitude uh, system. The atmosphere can be dramatically affected as well. So these, this sequence of events, powerful solar disturbances, propagation of those uh, toward the Earth under the right circumstances, leading to powerful enhancement of um, particles and, uh, and uh, currents, can lead to a plethora of different uh, space weather effects. And I'll now hand this off to Dr. Lanzarotti. Thank you very much, Dan. I'm uh, Louis Lanzarotti. I'm a professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark, New Jersey. I spent 37 years of my career, first part of my career at Bell Laboratories, AT&T and then Lucent Technologies, where a major part of my, my research and my activities were involved with the effects of space weather on telecommunication systems in particular, although I did get involved with some power systems 
uh, power grid systems at, at various times as a consultant. Uh, I'm principally, I'm currently one of the five principal investigators on the NASA Radiation Belt Storm Probes mission. Uh, it's almost, it's basically back to the future for me because that's how I started out in this field back in 1965 where we were trying to understand some of the radiation effects on Telstar satellites and the early geosynchronous communication satellites. In fact, the first effects of the, of the sun, other than sunlight and other than eclipses, on humans and on human technologies was the, occurred with the very invention of the first electrical technology that humans humans design, the telegraph system. As you can see here, there was a paper published in 19, 1849 by Barlow, who was the engineer of the, uh, of the Midland Railroad, uh, of the Midland Railroad Company in England. And he pointed out that he found observations of, of spontaneous electrical currents in the wires of the electric telegraph system along his railroad, the erection of which was carried out under his superintendency as the company's engineer. And what he noted was, what he noted was that in every case which has come under his observation, the telegraph needles were deflected whenever aurora has been visible. And in the last 150 years, the increase of human technologies and human electrical technologies in, in, in general has increased enormously, which are examples of this are recorded in, in, these la in this set of... Uh, just a, it's, a, it's a very small set of collection of headlines from the last couple of decades that I have of newspaper and magazine clippings. The Christian Science Monitor just this year noted that solar storms delivers a glancing blow to Earth, one of those coronal mass ejections that Dan, Dan Baker talked about. It was just a, just a warning. But back in 2007, Italy blamed the disruption of a NATO ComSat on strong solar activity. In 2003, during that event that Dan Baker just spoke about in, uh, in October 2003, solar storms cut airplane radio contact over the northern, over the northern pol polar regions from New York to the Far East. Solar storms can sometimes end up just a nuisance, but you, Yahoo proposed this, uh, early this year that space weather could wreak havoc in a gadget-driven world. So, as the sun awakens, a power grid stands vulnerable, as the Washington Post reported in 2011. So the, the, vastness of, uh, the, the, the vastness of the sun's activities on human electrical technologies is really quite potentially large and important. This, this, this illustration points out some of the human electrical technologies, communications, power grids, pipelines that can be affected by solar events, ranging from radar interference, satellite scintillations, radio wave uh, disruptions, which, can, which are the cause of the problems for airlines. You'll be hearing later in this talk about electrical grid disruptions, which are related to electrical currents in pipelines and also telecommunication uh, circuits under the ocean. And of course, as Dan pointed out, solar particles and galactic cosmic rays can affect spacecraft in very important ways, both the optics as well as the internal electronics. And that's the part of the, uh, that's p the major part of the mission of the NASA Radiation Belt Storm Probes mission, which I alluded to earlier. So all of these modern technologies that you see here and, e and ones under development always have to be evaluated in the context of whether the sun and some of its emissions of various types can affect these technologies are there mitigation procedures that we, can, uh, that we can design to eliminate or minimize them? Are there mitigation techniques that we can design in? And what do we need to know about the sun's environment and the sun's effects on the Earth's space environment in order to design systems that will survive? When, before I pass the baton here to uh, Dr. Hesse, I want to point out that when communication satellites, such as Telstar here, were first proposed by John Pierce at Bell Laboratories and by Sir Arthur Clarke, uh, uh, who was a science fiction writer, as most of you know, they had no reason to expect that the space environment around Earth would be anything but benign. But of course, Van Allen's measurements of the Van Allen radiation belt showed that that was not the case and that the first Telstar spacecraft designed with a benign environment basically in mind 
de failed after about seven, seven months in orbit. And so one really has to understand the Earth's space environment in order to design systems that will be resilient and that will operate under all conditions. With that, I'd like to pass it to Dr. Hesse. Hey, thank you, Lou. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, my name is Michael Hesse. I'm the uh, chief of the Space Weather Lab at NASA Goddard. And, uh, at NASA Goddard, we conduct a whole gamut of activities, uh, ranging from uh, building uh, and flying instrumentations in space uh, to measure the space environment and, and uh, provide inputs to uh, uh, models. We develop models at Goddard, we conduct research uh, with the data and with the models, and we uh, translate that all into a space weather forecasting with the primary goal of uh, NASA's uh, missions. So what I'd like to talk, uh, move into now is what are we actually doing about space weather? I think you've seen a wonderful, two wonderful introductions, really, about uh, the morphology of the space environment and, and its harmful effects. In fact, you've been treated to the most famous space weather chart in existence, uh, the last chart that Lou uh, showed. So if you want to move beyond that and you want to actually do something about space weather, you have to uh, look at a couple of steps that need to be taken here in order to provide the information you need. Uh, you have to start with uh, knowledge, and that's basically research uh, to, to understand the system well enough to uh, be able to predict it. Uh, then you need data and information uh, which uh, tell you uh, the state of the system now and which can then be used to drive models which you need to develop uh, and then you need to disseminate that information to the public. Uh, and I'm going to talk primarily about the data and information and model development activity. Uh, my, uh, the, uh, the two follow-on speakers here will talk about the dissemination and forecasting. So uh, the, the point I want to make here is that we are unlike meteorology, we are an evolving field, in a rapidly evolving field, as, you, as Dan told you, we're continuously ner learning uh, new, new facts about the space environment that can come handy for space weather forecasting. Our data are primarily and essentially from research missions, and I will show you ex examples of that, and those are evolving rapidly, uh, and our modeling capability is evolving rapidly, so you've got to be light on your feet to make the best out of that, and I will show you some examples in my uh, follow-on speakers world, too. So let's start with something really important, which is observing the sun. As Dan told you, space weather, by and large, originates uh, at the sun uh, as the primary driver of space weather throughout the heliosphere. What you're seeing in this plot here is the, is the ecliptic plane here. The sun is in the center here, and the planets out here is Earth. Here's Mercury, Mars, and, and uh, Venus, and Mars. And uh, there are two spacecraft here, the NASA stereo A and B spacecraft which uh, at, at an interesting vantage point because they allow us to look at the sun, so to speak, from the side relative uh, to the position of the Earth here. In near-Earth space, we have uh, the SDO spacecraft that was already mentioned before and, and uh, NASA, the NASA ESA SOHO spacecraft, which also look at the sun. And the uh, combination of those missions allows an unprecedented view of solar eruptions, not just from one vantage point, but from more than one, which allow us stereo analysis and prediction, a much better prediction of, of, of uh, uh, the evolution of eruptions. So I'm going to show you an example of that, uh, actually seen by all of these spacecraft in the next uh, slide. If you just memorize the position of them for a moment, then we can move on. So what you're seeing here is, and it should be plain. I don't know where it is. Surprising technical complication. Okay. <laughs> Space weather. Space weather, probably, yeah. Okay, I'm not, not quite sure what's happening here. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk my way through it. I don't want to keep this. Uh, uh, what you're seeing here is the view from SDO, which is a very, very high, the highest resolution imagery, global imager that, that uh, was ever built. Uh, the typical image size is 4K by 4K. Uh, and it allows you to, in this case, this uh, feature here, which erupted during that day, uh, it allows you to see that propagating out into space, starting at the very origin uh, near, near the sun. Uh, as it propagates out, it will form, uh, move into the, field of, the outer field of view of the SOHO spacecraft, which uh, you would see as an eruption propagating out to the side if this thing was working. I apologize that it didn't. Um, and then you, at the same time, have imagery from the two stereo spacecraft, stereo A and B. Uh, you see the eruption coming out this way on stereo A and this way in stereo B. 
which, uh, uh, if you take that information together and combine it, allows you to triangulate eruptions and give you, give you a heretofore impossible uh, means to determine its features, its opening angle, its speed, its propagation uh, direction, uh, all of which uh, allow you to predict, uh, make further predictions of uh, the, the uh, dispensation of that, uh, of that eruption. So for that, you typically need models, and I will show you an example of that, and I'm somewhat fearful of movies now. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, but uh, to make a point, uh, NASA uh, is, is a key player here in the model development, together with partners, the National Science Foundation and the two uh, Department of Defense agencies here in the United States who are sponsoring the development of, of uh, space research and, and space environment models, essentially models that we can use for both research and also for space weather forecasting. And these models are typically employed for a number of purposes. Research and education is one of them, of course, but then uh, models are being tested and validated, uh, particularly at Goddard, and then they're being used in various places, including at Goddard, for space weather forecasting for NASA, and they're employed by our friends at NOAA for forecasting and by our DOD colleagues as well, and uh, also used for other national needs. So one of those models, uh, which has been primarily sponsored by the uh, National Science Foundation, is actually routinely employed by us and, and, and also by NOAA, uh, in, uh, to predict uh, the impact of those coronal mass ejections. So I'm hoping that this movie will play. And it does something, but it doesn't play. It's bizarre. I'm really shocked. Okay, let, let me try something here quickly. Okay, I seem to be incapable of getting this to go. Well, I'm hoping that yours will work, because you, you would see a similar event uh, uh, in Auntie's presentation, following mine, uh, Dr. Pulkin's presentation. Uh, what you would see, if this were working, uh, would be a coronal mass ejection emerging from the sun here, propagating out into space, and just tangentially hitting the Earth here, uh, akin to what uh, uh, Dr. Lanzarotti just talked about in the previous presentation. Um, if you monitor the impact of that uh, presentation, you need a spacecraft uh, which is sitting uh, upstream of the Earth uh, uh, towards the sun, so you have a little bit of time uh, uh, between the measure, uh, receipt of the measurements of the uh, perturbation and its impact on the Earth. So I'm going to move on uh, to, the, to NASA's A spacecraft, which is doing, having just that function, sitting at about 220 Earth radii upstream of the Earth. Uh, and what ACE does for you, it, it measures uh, uh, the velocity and density of materia from the sun uh, propagating uh, uh, to, uh, through interplanetary space to the Earth. Uh, and uh, in this case here, you see the impact of the coronal mass ejection, this little blip here, and then there's a perturbation with a magnetic field associated with it as well. And uh, as you see, this is nothing out of the ordinary, uh, indicative of the fact that we did a pretty good job predicting uh, predicting the impact of that, uh, that eruption on Earth. Now, uh, as all of these missions, everything that's being used for forecasting, for truly forecasting, are research missions, and therefore they're continuously evolving. Uh, so we need to be able to, to take uh, advantage of new missions coming online, and I just want to point out one that's going to be coming uh, online next year, and that mission is called Radiation Belt Storm Probes. That sounds very fancy, but what it basically does, it re researches uh, the uh, ev formation and evolution of these uh, dangerous radiation belts in near-Earth space, which are filled with very high-energy particles of up to millions of volts, uh, 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 multiple of millions of volts of equivalent acceleration, uh, which are harmful for both uh, spacecraft or any humans uh, that might be transiting that region on wherever they might be going. Okay, this mission will be launched next year, uh, and like many NASA missions now, uh, radiation belt storm probes will involve the ability to broadcast real-time or near real-time space weather information to Earth so it can be used for space weather forecasting. So as, in that sense, uh, RBSP will not only uh, provide unprecedented research, but furthermore provide the opportunity to use the data uh, coming from the mission in real-time for further space weather forecasting. So with that, I'm going to move on, uh, hoping that your movies will work, uh, <laughs> to uh, Dr. Pulkinen, who's going to tell you more about how we, use, uh, how we apply that knowledge 
uh, to the benefit of uh, the space weather, uh, national space weather needs. Okay, thank you, Michael. Let's switch over the uh, presentation. Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Antti Pulkinen. Uh, I'm a professor at the Catholic University of America, and uh, I'm a research associate at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and Space with the Laboratory. Um, I've been heavily involved in uh, building modern space with the models over the past 10 years, uh, uh, focusing uh, modeling of various parts of the, the chain of space weather domain, all the way from, from the, the solar corona down to the actual actually upper mantle of the Earth. And I'm also a principal in investigator of the um, uh, Solar Shield project, uh, uh, which is a system residing at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And, and the purpose of that system is to look at for a costing of the space with the impacts on the high voltage power transmission grids. I will say a couple more words about that as we go along here. Uh, what I will try to do um, uh, with these few slides is to demonstrate you how now we have the, the emerging capability to start to forecast the space with the impact on, on space, space, spacecraft and, and high voltage power trans, transmission grids. Um, did we have a pointer somewhere here? Oh, okay. Um, from the, the modeling viewpoint, we are living really, really exciting time right now. Uh, more specifically, we're really witnessing the, the emergence of uh, the uh, uh, modern numerical space weather forecasting. This is a very similar fashion to the, the kind of emergence of, of uh, regular weather uh, uh, forecasting that took place several decades ago. Uh, we're going through the similar kind of a transition right now at this very moment in the field of space weather. And what has really uh, enabled this transition is a combination of three uh, uh, primary factors. Uh, first is, of course, the, the modern state-of-the-art uh, space with the observations, which were discussed, for example, uh, by Dr. Baker. Um, here's an example of, of uh, some of the remote solar imagery that we're, uh, the NASA is currently producing from the Sol uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. The second component uh, that is very important for this new emerging capability is the, uh, the new support computing uh, capacity. That combined with the, the incre rapidly increasing maturity of the uh, spa uh, physics-based uh, space weather models enables us to use the observations together with um, a modern space science models that we run in, in supercomputers to actually start to calculate what happens in the future. Okay? So it's really the combination of these uh, three key factors that now enables uh, us to start carry out modern numerical uh, space weather forecasting. And um, let's see if this movie works. Um, I guess the same problem. All right, never mind. Um, One of the key examples of what we can do nowadays with this new kind of a capacity is the, the simulation of the propagation of these coronal mass ejections throughout the interplanetary medium. Uh, how that process works is that you will use the remote solar imagery uh, of the likes that we've seen in, in, in a couple presentations already uh, to drive these large-scale simulations of the, the propagation of the coronal mass ejections. And, and then our more state-of-the-art models enable us to uh, 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 simulate which are the locations essentially throughout the solar system that will be impacted uh, uh, by these uh, eruptions. Let's see if we can get it going. <laughs> okay. No, no, you switch the other way, right? So, and, and what the modern space of the models also enable uh, us to do is to uh, uh, start to estimate the magnitude of the impact at these various locations throughout the solar system. So, for example, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, we have a forecasting activity and we provide daily forecasts for the, uh, NASA's robotic mission operators and indicate uh, uh, which locations can be impacted by some of these uh, uh, solar eruptions. For example, if we see eruption going towards the Mars, we can uh, alert uh, missions operating their assets over there, that there is a, a cloud approaching, and then we can also provide estimates, numerical based, uh, numerical forecasting based estimates about the magnitude of the impact that we can, uh, that we expect, expect, wow, okay. <laughs> Thank <you>. Applause. <laughs> so, um, okay, so here, here's an example of, of such a simulation. Uh, so the, the sun is here at the center. 
Uh, we're looking at the ecliptic plane. Uh, the orbit of the Earth is shown here uh, with this uh, yellow circle. And here is a sort of a classic signature of, of these propagating coronal mass ejections that are, as you can see from the simulation, of vast spatial scales. It takes about one to three days, uh, some of these eruptions, to propagate all the way from the sun, for example, to the orbit of the Earth. And now with these types of models, we can say uh, actually one to three days in advance which are the locations that are going to be impacted by these kinds of eruptions. And we are also able to provide uh, indications of the, the magnitude of the impact. This is actually very similar to, to uh, uh, hurricane uh, forecasting that a lot of people are familiar. In the hurricane forecast, you also estimate what is the path of the, the propagation of the hurricanes, and then also uh, people nowadays are able to tell uh, or provide estimates about the, the intensity of the hurricanes. These are kind of a space weather hurricanes that we're looking at here, and now we have this emerging capability to actually predict what will happen in the future. Um, <laughs> well, I guess we switched the idea. Uh, okay. All right, no, no, no. it's okay. So, um, one of the, the more exciting features of this numerical uh, space of the forecasting capacity is that now we can start look at a tailored forecast. Uh, uh, focused on specific uh, technological applications. And one of the, the primary technological applications are high voltage power transmission grids, which are impacted, as, as, as Dr. Lanzer mentioned earlier. Uh, the key point in, in, in carrying out the numerical uh, forecasts uh, and estimates about the, the space of the impact on high voltage power transmission grids is the, the use of uh, a NASA spacecraft that sits uh, in a, a, a point between the Sun and the Earth that is called the Lagrange 1 point. And and the spacecraft that sits there is the Advanced Composition Explorer and ACE. What ACE allows us to do is uh, to uh, use the observational information to drive another set of uh, modern space weather models. Uh, these are called magnetospheric models. And the magnetospheric models uh, simulate uh, from the physics based what will happen in the Earth's near space environment in the near future. And, and uh, one really interesting feature of these magnetospheric models is that they are providing information also about the, the electric current fluctuations in the Earth's upper atmosphere. And these are the fluctuations that then couple in an antenna-like fashion to the high voltage power transmission grids and cause uh, potential problems in operating these transmission grids. So now, for the first time, we are able to actually model uh, uh, fully physics-based how these electric currents fluctuate and how they couple to electric power transmission grids. And that enables us to actually uh, calculate numerically what will be the impact on the high voltage power transmission grids. So we really start to understand this process on the level that we have the capacity to uh, forecast the future events already, uh, or, or, all, all the way down to the, the very highly tailored specific uh, applications. And of course, those forecasts then enable uh, the, the operators of these systems uh, to carry out possible mitigation actions. So summarizing, uh, we're truly witnessing the emergence of the, uh, the, uh, the birth, if you will, of modern numerical space of the forecasting. And that is um, uh, enabled by the combination of these three main factors, the modern space-based observations of the space of the phenomenon, the modern supercomputing capacity, and the uh, uh, rapidly increasing maturity of the, the modern uh, space science models. And with that, I will hand it over to Rodney. Thank you. I'm. Uh Rodney Virick. I'm with the Space Weather Prediction Center. Uh, I'm the director of the Space Weather Prediction Testbed. We are the beneficiaries of all this excellent research, these new capabilities, these new data. And like the other forecast offices within the National Weather Service, we take this research and turn it into operational products and services for customers. This chart lists a few of our customer areas. Uh, where we provide these services, the electric power grid, as Auntie just talked about, is a, a very important customer. HF radio operators, commercial airlines, emergency managers, oil exploration, satellite navigation, such as GPS. In addition, we provide services to a number of government agencies like NASA, DOD, FAA, and the Federal Emergency Management Association, FEMA. The plot here shows uh, one of our product suites uh, basically, uh, it started in 2005 and has ramped up in spite of the fact that we've been in solar minimum, as shown by the red plot. 
But then as soon as the solar cycle started to pick up, you can see that there was an increase in the, uh, the essentially an increase in the increase in the number of uh, customers signing up for these products. Many of these customers are using new technologies, things that have never seen major space weather storms. And so we're trying to ramp up our capabilities to support the new technologies that are now coming online. We're at the Space Weather Prediction Center. These are three primary capabilities. We have a Space Weather Forecast Office. This is the heart of our organization. It uh, operates 24-7 and provides the alerts, watches, and warnings, much like the Terrestrial Weather Forecast Office in your local area provides you with warnings of snowstorms. But you, every forecast is only as good as the science behind it. So we have a development and transition team which takes the research that you've heard about and transitions it into an operational environment, making it much more reliable and more robust. And then there's the, the space weather prediction test bed, which is out looking for the new capabilities, the new models, the new data that are out in the environment or in the research world, uh, testing them, finding out which ones will be the most valuable for uh, improving our forecasts. Here are some of the capabilities and activities we've been working on at the test bed. You've seen this plot in the movies uh, of the Wang Shili RG model, which is the uh, first physics-based space weather prediction model that's been transitioned to operations. This model is now running at the National Weather Service at the supercomputers alongside the terrestrial weather forecast models that we use every day. This is, uh, provides excellent improvement to our one, two, and three-day forecast of geomagnetic storms, as Auntie had just discussed. But we can't stop. This is a first on a long road to developing the capabilities needed to support customers. The next model, we're working with the NASA Community Coordinated Modeling Center to evaluate these magnetospheric models to try and identify which ones are going to provide the most accurate uh, inputs for the electric power grid and which ones are uh, operationally supportable. In addition, we've heard from the, G the GPS community that they would like better forecasts of the conditions that affect their uh, GPS uh, navigation devices. So we've developed the whole atmospheric model, which essentially extends from the ground all the way up into space, uh, modeling capabilities to provide the information for that particular customer base. Someday, not too far in the future, the same model which predicts snowstorms in New England and weather in San Francisco will also predict whether or not your GPS will malfunction or whether the satellite drag will increase causing problems for satellite operators. We're also providing new products for aurora forecasts as you see in the lower, lower right. Of course, the models are only as good as the data that drives them. And you heard the importance of the A satellite at this L1 point between Earth and Sun. It's our one sentinel out there providing us with some warnings of these geomagnetic storms. That satellite is 10 years beyond its design life. And we now can announce that the follow-on satellite, Discover, has made it through the budgetary process and is, is uh, funded in the FY12 budget to provide a follow-on capability for ACE. This has been an excellent collaboration between NOAA, NASA, and the Department of Defense. And we anticipate launch sometime in January 2014. So in conclusion, the things that you've heard about, we're taking full advantage of and putting into the operational world of space weather forecasting. The new capabilities, the excellent partnerships will continue as space weather and the new cycle, solar cycle ramp up towards the next solar maximum. And even though we anticipate this to be an average size solar cycle, we should point out that in the past, the very large storms, such as the 1859 storms that uh, Lou alluded to, occurred during an average size solar cycle. Thank you very much.
<laughs> okay, maybe I can. In your answer, could you identify who you are, please? Uh, I mean, the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center is the official source of space weather information in the, in the nation. But uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, space weather research and development is a rapidly evolving field. Uh, so as a result of that, uh, while there is one source which is the authoritative uh, source for the nation, uh, you know, other places may come up with other estimates which, which may be just as good uh, and, and to provide additional information. The, the fact that there is no simple single answer like uh, you get from the National Weather Service regarding hurricane prediction uh, is simply a, a consequence of, of the situation we're in, that we're in a, in an evolving field where we're learning new things, new capabilities come online and be, um, being brought to bear on this problem. Uh, that, and, and, and that can at times lead to the situation that two different organizations come up with two different predictions. Uh, the uh, question as to which one of those is better is something that we are investigating continuously on, on both the NOAA and the NASA side by doing real-time validations and comparing notes and so on and, and uh, 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 making uh, a, educated decisions as to which kind of models we bring into our own operations in the future. But there's no simple answer to that question, and that's just the nature of the beast we're in. It just tells us that we have to do more to, uh, to move into s the same level of fidelity that we have in, in, in weather forecasting. This is Rodney Varick from the Space Weather Prediction Center. And I would only add that the terrestrial weather environment and forecasting has similar issues in that the National Weather Service will predict the official weather forecasts but you may find your local television station or the, the Weather Channel or any, of the, any number of third-party uh, uh, providers of services providing additional information, slightly different information. Uh, the public learns how to understand and accept those differences and goes to the place where they find the most reliable and uh, easily accessible information. Uh, this is Dan Baker. Um, indeed, this deep minimum raised a number of questions about what the sun would do next. And uh, we've just seen in the last uh, few months that uh, solar activity has picked up quite dramatically. The number of sunspots has gone up uh, rather meteorically. But we don't know uh, for sure how large the maximum is going to be, nor do we know that. Uh, in fact, it has been well shown, I think Rodney may have mentioned this, that some of the largest solar disturbances on record, large solar storms on record, actually occurred during relatively um, modest sunspot uh, peak periods. So um, if we knew for sure that there was a direct correlation between the most damaging solar storms and the largest uh, sunspot uh, activity periods, uh, that would be one thing, but we don't know that for uh, sure. I think it's, it behooves all of us who are involved in the science and the application of that science in space weather to avoid the chicken little syndrome, the sky is falling. But we also think it's important to put this in the proper perspective. These low frequency, high consequence events have to be prepared for. Uh, our society is increasingly reliant on technologies that can be affected by um, solar disturbances. We've seen uh, that's manifested dramatically in the last uh, decade or two. And a report that I was privileged to chair, uh, which I think there are copies in the back, the economic and societal impacts of space weather tried to put this into some context. And it's really tried to address this question that we want to put this in the whole uh, panorama of risks that society faces. But uh, we as a highly developed uh, uh, society um, run tr a tremendous risk from these kinds of events. and. Um, it behooves us to try to prepare ourselves and to be uh, relatively sure that we can deal with the most severe events. Uh, Lou? 
Yes, this is Louis Lanzarotti from uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. I would like to just uh, emphasize what, what Dan has just said. I believe the uh, community of interested researchers and engineers are, have not uh, by any means uh, tried to hype or chicken little uh, these effects. Speaking from my career, long, very long career in industry, uh, this is the, these kinds of uh, these kinds of issues are ones that uh, are necessary for industrial uh, folks and government folks to uh, uh, planners to think about in the context of uh, risk analysis and to do appropriate risk analysis uh, thereby. And and as we have this increase in our electrical technologies, it is important that we do the appropriate uh, risk analysis and risk assessment, which is uh, one of the things that's advocated in the report that uh, Dan just uh, referred to that he chaired. And so it's not at all irresponsible uh, to, uh, to take these kinds of risk uh, studies into account, at the same time to modulate and to understand the, the details and not to overhype. Uh, it is very important, again, I want to emphasize and co copy Dan essentially, to uh, recognize that uh, we do have large solar events that occur during solar minimum kinds of conditions. And therefore, one has to have these, uh, it's only reasonable to have these types of risk studies and risk analysis. And uh, what, what I could add, you know, to the uh, one to three day lead time, Part of the question is that uh, I've been involved in, in, in a number of activities in, in U.S. and internationally looking at, for example, the space, spacecraft impacts and power grid impacts. And um, I can tell you that, uh, for example, the power grid operators, they are truly concerned about this. And um, um, if we are able to provide one to, uh, one to three day lead time for a cause of the, the impending impact, uh, for these types of end users, it is extremely useful and helpful information uh, 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 for those operators. That enables them to mitigate these impacts. So um, even though, as, as uh, Dan and Lou explained, uh, we, we really do not understand the, the physics uh, of the system well enough to tell, for example, months, let alone years in advance what's going to happen, but, but this uh, one to take three day lead time for a causing capacity is already something that, that is, is uh, useful for, for the potential end users. There, there, are some, uh, there are some solar effects on uh, technologies that uh, don't have a one to three day uh, a warning, as a matter of fact. There are some that don't have any warning at all, and those are perhaps the most uh, interesting and uh, physically, physics challenged. Uh, for example, in 2006, there was a huge solar radio burst that occurred. Uh, solar radio noise that travels at the same speed as the sunlight. And so it arrived at the same time as sunlight. This solar radio burst knocked out all GPS across the United States and knocked out the uh, uh, vertical landing capabilities that would exist in terms of GPS landing for more than 10 minutes across the entire United States. There was no warning of that at all. We do not understand any of the physics behind the solar flare event, how many electrons are produced, how much radio noise, and how many x-rays those electrons produce. There is no prediction of that, and there is no warning of those kinds of events. I'm not saying that as a way of hype. I'm just pointing out uh, some of the fundamental physics that we don't understand and that we need to take into account in terms of our risk analysis. Now, the risk of that, what is the risk of that? Well, that's the whole point of risk analysis and risk assessment. And those are the kinds of things we need to, we need to study and we need to examine. And we don't have to say the sky is falling. We just need to say, hey, we don't understand that. Let's do some more study. OK, let's move on to another question. Harvey? Uh, Harvey Leifert, Freelance. Is space weather prediction an entirely United States activity? Are other countries involved in this also? Yeah, uh, Michael has and NASA got it. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, the United States has undoubtedly uh, uh, yeah. looked at space weather uh, first uh, and, and started looking, looking at this in, in seriousness quite a few years ago. Uh, and with the uh, major uh, research activities sponsored by primarily NASA but also NSF and, and uh, um, DOD, uh, has made a lot of progress moving in, in, into the direction of space weather forecasting and, and, and uh, mitigating harmful space weather effects. But other nations have recognized that too. There are space weather programs, for example, at, uh, in ESA, at, in, in Europe. Uh, in fact, I just came from a conference over there, which uh, an annual conference where they discuss their program and their 
progress, and, and they're making rapid progress. There are also other space weather programs in, in countries like Japan, uh, Russia, and, 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 and China, and, and so on. Uh, there's a, a worldwide organization called the World Meteorological Organization, which is uh, uh, at least in part an umbrella organization for, of space weather research activities and, and, uh, worldwide, and an international uh, space weather forecasting service uh, that uh, uh, NOAA, for example, is, is, is party to in the United States. So I, I think the United States is, is uh, well, the first to take this seriously and, and uh, start uh, addressing it, but other countries are in the game too. Okay, let's move on to our last question. Hi, Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters. Um, for Rodney, first of all, can you, I think I saw in your chart that you now have 19,000 customers signed up for your space weather products. Is that right? And um, for you there, Lou, hi, and uh, Ordan. Um, could you just talk a little bit about what sort of mitigating um, things companies or individuals can do um, if there is advance warning of, uh, of a solar storm? I mean, is this the kind of thing where you, you know, suggest people keep a landline or exactly, you know, how should people think about storm predictions? Thanks. Each of the industries that I mentioned have their own methods of mitigating or just preparing for those space weather storms that come, and each one have different thresholds of pain, as it were, levels at which they, their systems are affected. The power grid companies will actually adjust their power line voltages to bring them down from peak, allowing them to absorb some of the fluctuations that are induced by the space weather events. Uh, airlines who uh, rely on HF communication as their primary mode of uh, communication between ground and the aircraft will can use uh, satellite communication when they're below a certain latitude, but when they go over the poles, they typically lose contact with the uh, the ge geosynchronous satellites, and so therefore they're required by law to avoid those high latitudes. They will actually redirect flights, uh, keeping them out of that high latitude region. Uh, GPS users who rely on high accuracy GPS, the drilling companies, for instance, who are out in the ocean who uh, need to have three meter accuracy or better for their drilling ships, will actually postpone or delay activities during uh, periods of high, ac uh, uh, high active ge geomagnetic storms. So each industry has its own method of mitigating. Uh, some of the more knowledgeable and experienced industries are very well versed and know exactly what to do. Others that are coming online with new technologies, new ways to use GPS in ways that we've never thought of before. For instance, farming. I think that the um, boom of the use of GPS in farming is something that's new since the last solar maximum. And they'll have to learn how to mitigate and, and work around the problems as they occur. Um, that answers your question. So, okay, uh, excuse me. I'm going to have to um, stop the, okay. the thing right now because we've got another one coming in okay. and this one's been running long. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. So thanks everyone for being here. We're going to also have to ask that the presenters go out into the corridor out in the back. So if reporters would like to ask more questions, you can join them out there. And thank you very much. We have another um, press conference.